In 2012, it's fair to say the world is getting smaller. At least when it comes to the animal kingdom. From tiny terriers to teacup kitties. Curious critters to dinky horses. Small pets are now a big part of our everyday lives. Not all of them make good household pets. But there's one thing we can all agree on. Super tiny animals rock. Rocky's worth every penny. Look at him. He's not a normal dog. Some are more unusual than others. If they do get angry, they can give a nasty bite. Some are more talented than others. Welcome, my puppy! And for that, you get a full Ridge Tea Biscuit. But they're all just as cute as each other. They have been really cute together. They snuggle and, and love each other. It takes all sorts. Some prefer their furry friends to be off the scale. Your smaller rabbits just want to run round and, and, you know, not be loved. But be warned, big or small, furry or fluffy, cute or even a little bit creepy, as you're about to see, they all can and will melt your heart. I thought, oh no, I, I, you know, another, another one that's going to break my heart. Welcome to the wonderful world of super tiny animals. With 22 million pets between us, we Brits are undoubtedly a nation of animal lovers. And for many, it seems the smaller the pet, the better. Whilst dressing up our little darlings is nothing new, animal accessories are now posting record profits. In 2012, it's estimated we'll spend 30 million in the UK alone. It's easy to see why the line between the patter of tiny feet and the patter of tiny paws is starting to blur. In fact, for some, it's disappeared altogether. Meet 27-year-old Lindsay, who lives in Kent, with her baby Rocky. But take a closer look, and things aren't quite what you'd expect. That's no baby, it's a chihuahua. <laughs> Lindsay is one of a growing number of owners who spend as much on their pets as some people spend on their children. Brooke is my fur baby because he's furry and he's my baby. <coughs> Rocky hasn't got a clue that he's a super tiny animal. I think he thinks he's as big as a giraffe. Um, he's not phased by anything or anyone. Get it, Tilly. <coughs> he's just crazy. He lives up to his name. He may look like a tiny, tough guy, but at heart, Rocky is just a big softy. Oh, Rocky. You love the ladies' lovings. You're a lucky boy. Rocky sleeps in bed with me. I don't know some people are like, oh, you let a dog sleep in your bed, but look at him. He's not a normal dog. In fact, Rocky's been named Britain's best dressed dog. Strike a pause. Here's just some of Rocky's clothes. Santa, Rudolph, pyjamas, dressing gown, snowsuit, army suit, camo dinosaur, Winnie the Pooh, bumblebee, super dog, Addy dog, tough guy, I was recently asked how much um, I've spent on Rocky, so I sat there and tallied up some of it, and it was just below the uh, £3,000 mark. Yes, I know that's crazy, but Rocky's worth every penny. Oh. In the UK, being a pampered pet parent makes Lindsay stand out from the crowd. But over in America, having a fur baby is fast becoming one of the best ways to fit in. In New York, a growing social scene centred around super tiny pets has emerged, and at its heart are the doggy moms. Erica, Ashley, Karen, Grace and Leslie are the stars of their very own reality TV series. Think sex in the city, but a bit woof around the edges. Oh boy. Doggy Moms is a six-part cable TV series. 
It's a prom, but it's for puppies. First airing on NYC TV in February last year, it's relatively new, but the ladies are gearing up for series two. The show follows the hectic social life of the five doggy moms. Not fair. Really not fair. But the real stars are their fur babies. Hi, these are my two Yorkshire Terriers, Portia and Rosie, loves of my life. This is Cubby, and this is Ginger. Misty May. It's Ali Sue. This is Eli, the celebrity chihuahua. So what does it take to be a doggy mom? A doggy mom is somebody that treats their dog just like a child. You definitely need to be over the top, not your typical dog owner. When I'm talking about her with other people, I mistakenly call her my daughter. Hello, baby. Ooh. I think that's OK. But to be a real bona fide doggy mum, you and your fur baby have to look the part. Eli and I are wearing matching silver rain jackets. He also has sunglasses that match mine, which I can show you. Hello, baby. Portia has uh, some sunglasses, and Rosie has a little hat to protect her eyes. You do not need to be glamorous and fabulous to be a doggy mom. Eli and I are glamorous and fabulous, but it's not a requisite. <laughs> it's fair to say that the doggy moms pamper their pooches and give them an unconventional upbringing. Not every dog gets a bedtime story before Bobo's. Clifford's other sister, Bonnie, was a farm dog. The best dog of all. The end. Misty, are you sleeping now? Roll over or operatic Eli. training. Roll over Eli for me. Good boy. Now show me shy guy. Now show me shy guy for me. Good boy. Forget walkies for exercise. Ashley's babies do doggy burlesque. Go ahead. Good boy. It's basically burlesque, but it's involving dogs. It's um, certainly something that needs to be rehearsed a million times. It's a lot of fun. And this doggy tale of New York has other benefits. It's become a way for lonely people in a big city to make new friends, with a doggy diary simply packed with poochy parties. Basically, any kind of event you would do with a human has been modified to include dogs. Events include everything from charity walkies, bark mitzvahs, and cocktail yappy hours. But the main event in the canine calendar this season is a fancy dress doggy wedding. And as we'll see later, one of our fur babies will be playing a pivotal role at the pup jewels. As ordained ministers, Eli and I wear special outfits. Hallelujah. And this is how we will officiate at the wedding. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today before all dogs and witnesses to join Chewy and Sadie in the sacrament of holy matrimony. I think we're ready. Amen to that. In 2012, Olympic fever is everywhere. But it's not just the world's athletes striving to be the best. A quick click online and it's clear that the animal kingdom is keen to compete too. Representing America is Ratatouille, the snowboarding opossum. And for Austria, this mouse in a million isn't letting anything get in the way of a gold. But the British entry was destined for far more than just internet fame. Meet two-year-old Truffles, whose owners, Nicole and Chloe, took a leap of faith on the Guinness World Record for the long-jumping guinea pig. So the longest jumping guinea pigs was 20.5 centimetres. Um, so I thought I could maybe test it on my guinea pigs. We put cucumbers on <laughs> the box that he's going to jump on, so he has something that he wants to jump for. And then um, we just sort of moved the boxes further and further away. Yay. By March 2012, Mum Angela and the girls were confident Truffles was ready to take on the world record of 20.5 centimetres and contacted Guinness for official instructions. We had to be organise a public event and um, with witnesses and witness statements. So then we had to bring them along to the scout hall and all of the scouts were like 
really looking forward to watching this uh, world record being broken. And then when he jumped, there was like a massive cheer. Everybody was so excited. Because he like broke the world record. The next thing we knew, it was worldwide, basically. <laughs> and it was in all the papers. But what they hadn't reckoned with was all the publicity prompting a mini internet stampede to break Truffle's record. And already one cheeky contender has notched up 40 centimetres. Sadly, Truffles had to retire from the sport earlier this year due to a nasty chest infection. But even if he no longer holds the world record, he'll always be a champion to us. Yay! But Truffles isn't the only clever little pig in the country. In Port Maddock, North Wales, we find another animal hogging the limelight. Last year, little Louie, the micro-pig, hit the headlines as Britain's first performing porker. Over. Over. Good boy. Louie's owner, Sue Williams, is a professional dog trainer and co-director of the Cheshire Dog Display Team. Two years ago, Sue struck on the idea of training her miniature pig to see if her methods would work on animals that aren't pre-programmed to please their owners. With the pig, so you can't push and pull them. That's a good lad. They've got to want to do it. We've, we've, good, good boy. And that's the secret of training, and that's the message I try and get through with the dogs as well. She soon discovered, minor itches aside, that pigs could perform just as well as dogs, and decided to take Louis on tour to show that with the right training, anything is possible. When I go out to do shows, when the pigs come out, normally we get a double take, and then, of course, once the pig starts to do things... People really then start to realise the importance of this training and how successful you can be if you do it in the right way. <laughs> but one year on, success has gone to Louis's belly. He's more of a macro pig than a micro pig these days. And he's now too fat to cut it as a performer. Good boy, that's it. Good. So again, with pigs, what you find is that as they grow, um, they become a little bit less mobile. And Louis now, he's slowing down a little bit. He's still very good at doing everything. But really, he needs a bit of a younger, faster model coming up through the ranks <laughs> to take over when he gets tired. Enter Louis Mark II. Twelve-month-old Poppy, the new pig on the block. She's coming along really well. Uh, she's been getting to do most of the obstacles. Girl. We've not done the seesaw yet. She's got to learn how to do that one yet. Come on, Poppy. This is going to be her first ever go at it. So fingers crossed that she enjoys it and she's nice and confident. Walk on. Good girl. Walk on. What makes the seesaw really difficult is the fact that it moves and there's a noise element as well as the movement element. Good. Clever girl. Well done. Oh, well done, Poppy. And for that, you're going to definitely get a full rich tea biscuit, your favourite. There's a good girl. The most important thing for me is the well, you know, the welfare of the animal and that she's actually enjoying what she's doing. So that's the important side. Not all super tiny farm animals need to jump through hoops to grab our attention. <laughs> Meet the miniature Dexter cows, who measure up at half the size of their commercial size cousins. And if you thought only baby sheep were cute, think again. These are miniature Southdowns, otherwise known as baby doll sheep. It has a really interesting face. Many people compare it to a teddy bear, and it always seems to have a really smiley grin on its face. Never having farmed in his life, Alan Woodman bought a six-acre small holding in Wales seven years ago. He found that Southdown sheep make marvellous lawnmowers and invested in three mini munchers. I read an article 
about the miniature South Downs and they sounded absolutely perfect for the small holding to help me keep the grass down but at the same time I wanted sheep that were really friendly and uh, would you know breed and give me an interest. And breed they did. He now has a herd of 17 and whilst they can be bred for their meat, for Alan it's purely for pleasure. I have just been so smitten by the breed. I have to say, I think I love them. <laughs> when you look at them, you can see they have the most endearing face and that they are such a friendly sheep. The baby doll sheep have a very sweet temperament and make great companions, fleece producers, grass trimmers and even pets. My friends who farm uh, sheep around here will tell me that they believe that when a sheep gets up in the morning... There we are. Do you just get in there? The first thing it says to itself is, how can I get into trouble today? How can I hurt myself? There we are. OK, we're ready, Cabri. Off you go. And the miniatures, they are absolutely superb because they have none of that trait. They are so happy in the field, they don't challenge the fences, and when you go in the field, they don't run away, which is a bonus. So they are just brilliant for that as alone. That's one of the reasons I've really grown to like them. Ironically, in a world where super tiny animals are on the up, these super tiny sheep have been going the other way. The breed date back to the 1700s, when they were popular because there was just enough meat on them to feed a family, without any going to waste. But when the introduction of refrigeration meant waste wasn't an issue, bigger soon became better. And by the start of the 20th century, baby doll sheep had almost disappeared. Something Alan hopes to change. You're the hope, you're the big future, aren't you, hey girl? Come on, boys and girls. I found that they were extremely rare. And in fact, there were only about 24 or 30 in the country. Come on and that compares with over half a million in the late 18th uh, 19th centuries. And so I think it's very important that over the next 20 or 30 years, we build up a flock that becomes sustainable. Alan's big hope for his little sheep is to help re-establish the baby doll breed in Britain. They look really happy now. They're out in the, where they want to be, on the pasture and they're part of our heritage. And so that's why I believe that uh, people will love them and will fall in love with them as well. As some of the most pampered pets on the planet, super tiny animals often live a life of luxury and leisure. But over in Jacksonville, Florida, we find one who has to turn up for work day in, day out just like the rest of us. You won't find her answering the phone, though, because she's uh, a little horse. 11-year-old miniature Princess Confetti goes to work with her owner, Cheryl, because her job is to be Cheryl's eyes. JBR Princess Confetti is my guide horse. She's a miniature Appaloosa horse. She's bigger than a German Shepherd, smaller than a Great Dane. Cheryl lost her sight when she was just 17 years old. After two guide dogs, 12 years ago, she decided to try a guide horse. Confetti is trained to do most everything that a guide dog is trained to do. If I'm in the kitchen and I happen to drop something, her natural curiosity will go over to it. See what it says, this is the usually here. And I can follow her and find the object that I dropped. And it's pretty cool that she'll do that. Walk up. Up All right. And her super tiny size comes in handy. It, it's very important for Confetti to be a small stature because she has to be able to navigate me through doorways around in crowded places, so small is best. Hey girl. Confetti is one of only four working guide horses in the world. She's been thoroughly house-trained so she can go absolutely everywhere with her owner. 
The job of training confetti was largely down to Cheryl's husband, Chris. Good, good girl. Yes, sir. Horses don't learn as fast as dogs do. So you need to repeat things yeah. over and over and over. Find home. Walk. Find With home. horses, if it's not Find safe, home. or if they think it's not safe, they won't do it. Good girl, good home. She really girl. needs to be taught that a thing is safe to do. <laughs> One of the original reasons Cheryl chose confetti was because guide horses live longer than guide dogs. But what Cheryl didn't realize was how much more confetti would improve her life. Not just helping her deal with her disability, but helping other people deal with it too. The first reaction to confetti is shock. The second reaction is amazement. And then the amazement turns into pure joy. Say hi. She'll give you a kiss. <laughs> Aww. It's a very rewarding experience because people see the horse and they don't see my disability. And it's a very freeing experience. <laughs> so sweet. And I actually forget she's a horse until somebody says, oh, look at the pony. She is a member of the family. We have just woven her into the fabric of our lives and she fits in so well. It isn't just house pets that can be super tiny. All around the globe, compact critters can be found out in the wild. But whilst most exotics usually live in far-flung corners of the world, some have started to creep into our homes, and one of them is the sugar glider. 19-year-old Kaylee lives in this ordinary suburban semi in Cambridge with her mum, her dad and some rather unusual house guests. Some super spiky, some super snoopy, some super slithery and, of course, some super tiny. These are two of our baby sugar gliders which have recently been born and their eyes have only just opened in the past couple of days. So they're getting to the stage now where they're at their cutest. Native to Australia, the sugar glider is one of the smallest marsupials in the world. Fully grown, they're about as big as a 20 pound note. They're not just unusual looking, they also have an unusual characteristic. They can fly. Jumping. Well, sort of fly. Uh, sugar gliders can't fly. They more fall with grace. So they've got a flap of skin in between their front and back legs there. If you can see that flap of skin, that's what they use. It works as a parachute to help them when they're gliding. So they can't go up. They fall down slowly. Sugar gliders, so called because of their diet of sweet fruit, have been nicknamed pocket pets because they love to snuggle in small spaces. But they're not quite as sweet as they seem. They can get exceedingly tame, but they do still have very sharp teeth, so if they do get angry, they can give a nasty bite. And they have very sharp claws, so when they're climbing just up your arms, they can leave scratch marks. Small wonder the RSPCA do not recommend sugar gliders as household pets. But like other exotics, many people learn the hard way. We've got over 100 animals here and about 70% of ours are rescue animals because people can't keep up with the commitments that they need anymore or look after them paying for their food. Kaylee and her family have spent over 15 years researching wild and exotic creatures. They've undergone training and checks to ensure their rescue animals receive the best care. Owning an exotic pet does begin to take over your life. Um, they take up lots of space, lots of time, and you need to constantly be doing your research. But despite the hard work, expense and training, Kaylee knows she's lucky to have her own super tiny zoo in her home. Not many people can hug a meerkat whenever they want to or have a sugar glider flying round the room, so I am very lucky. Animals at the other end of the scale can be pretty jaw-dropping too. Welcome to Tucson, Arizona, and George, who was crowned the world's biggest dog by Guinness in 2010. 
At 43 inches high, he towers over the world's smallest dog, Boo Boo, by 39 inches. And in Wisconsin, we find another big boy. In fact, it's hard to miss him. At over 20 hands high and weighing in at 186 stone, Jack is around two feet taller than the average horse and almost four times bigger than the world's smallest. But America isn't the only place to track down animals at the other end of the super tiny scale. As we discovered when we headed to a quaint little village near Worcester, a small close-knit community nestling in the quiet backwaters of the Cotswolds. A perfect snapshot of life in rural England. With one exception. Rabbit, 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 Meet Darius, who has a rather enormous claim to fame. Yeah, he's the largest bunny in the world. Oh, really? Yeah. Look at him. You've got beautiful skin. Good shot there. You've got a beautiful oh, how sweet. Face. I'll get him out. <laughs> Darius's owner is Annette Edwards. A best, Come on, mate. It's not hide and seek. Who, it's fair to say, is a firm believer that bigger is better. Come on, you little... And not just when it comes to her animals. This one-time Jessica Rabbit look-alike isn't afraid to make the most of her biggest assets. My new claim to fame now is my Guinness World Record um, oldest page three model. But it's her big bunnies that are closest to her heart. I'm actually not a lover of small bunnies. You smaller rabbits just want to run round and, and, you know, not be loved. But as pets, I think the giant rabbits are a bit special. They're cuddly. They're really nice animals. The Dutch giant continentals, as their name suggests, already dwarf the average domestic bunny. The giant, the giant rabbit. Come on, Darius. But at four foot four inches, Darius is nearly a foot and a half bigger than the average giant. People do think he's like a monster because sheer, the sheer size of him. But this isn't Annette's first record-winning rabbit. In fact, it runs, or should I say hops, in the family. Ten years ago, there was Amy, who measured in at four foot. Amy just kept growing and growing. And, believe it or not, Amy appeared just in a local paper. From there, the Nationals got involved. Amy won the Guinness World Record in 2005. I bred and... Um, to my surprise, my rabbits just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Next came Darius's mammoth mum, Alice. And then came Darius, who beat his mum's world record in 2010. But he's not stopping there. And now he's just put on another inch, so he's now four foot four. Darius's celebrity status means... Darius, come on that he travels the world, or at least the country, for public appearances like this one at Borton on the Water Model Village. Come on, silly boy, come on. And it doesn't look like the Guinness World Record for the world's biggest rabbit will be leaving the family anytime soon. Darius's son is very, very special. He's bigger than any rabbit I've ever seen at that age. So, I just don't know what to expect here. So watch this space. Back in New York City, the day of the doggy wedding has arrived. This may look like a big empty room, but by nightfall it will be transformed into a Persian palace. One of the organisers behind tonight's Arabian-themed wedding is doggy fashion designer Ada Neves. I've been doing pop shows for almost 10 years now. I have a long line of dogs that I have helped celebrate their marriage. <laughs> Ada takes her responsibilities very seriously, especially when it comes to the doggy dress code. No dog can be naked at any event in New York City. There's no excuse. 
but that's a big no, no. People are going to notice. And if they are doggies that are the socialites, they're gonna feel sorry for you. So if I see a dog naked, I say, honey, come on, put on something before you take a picture. <laughs> you can't take a picture naked. You're not Lady Godiva, no. <laughs> No fear of the doggy mums ending up in the doghouse then. Oh, Roberto's gonna love the way you look in his clothes. They've pulled out all the stops and the props. No one more so than Grace with her two Turkish delightful terriers. I think it looks wonderful. <laughs> I think I'm more excited than, than my dogs. I love dressing up and I love getting in costume, putting on wigs and, and all sorts of stuff. And this is just so great to be able to do it with the dog. I think we all coordinate so nicely. And um, I think they should be very happy with the way they look. I know, I know, I know you'd like to kiss me. I know, I know. Something about me that's irresistible, I know. So we're just gonna have a wonderful time. Right? I'm looking forward to it. Are you looking forward to it? Are you looking forward to it? We gotta get going. Hmm? We gotta get going. Okay, just relax while I get ready. Not before one final transformation. Over at the wedding venue, it's all gone a little bit bizarre. is on fire, there is everything going on. Belly dancers, through live music. It is just out of this world. It's really fun, it's really a lot of fun. The girls are having a nice time, right? The doggy moms and their fur babies have stepped out in their finest. And though it's two massive mops going walkies down the aisle, it's the super tiny Eli who will oversee the puptuals. They called it puppy love. I think Eli's ready. I think he's excited about it. He's very mellow tonight, though. If anyone can show why this couple should not be lawfully wedded, may you bark now or forever hold your peace. With the power vested in me by the state of New York, I now pronounce you dog and wife. You may now kiss the bride. Whilst this may look like the weirdest wedding reception on the planet, it's a perfect snapshot of the New York City social scene. Doggy style. such an average day on the New York dog scene. We do crazy things like this all the time in Manhattan. You're tired, aren't you? He is. Home time, quick bedtime story, and off to the land of Nod. Sleep tight. Mwah. As we've already seen, super tiny animals can come in all shapes and sizes. And super tiny dogs come in even more shapes and sizes than they ever have before. There we go. <laughs> there are over 40 new breeds of designer dog. Uh, they are uh, Shih Tzu Poos. So that's a Shih Tzu and a Poodle mixed together. And as we see at the Teacup Puppy Boutique in Florida, many are made in miniature. Maltesers have hair, not fur, um, so there is no shedding. And they're also hypoallergenic. As the most popular household pets in the world, it's hardly surprising that there's such a wide range to pick from for those in search of what many call a handbag dog. But it is a surprise that the handbag cat hasn't really made its mark. Hi, sweetie. The most popular miniature moggy on the market is the mini Persian. A combination of the gingers and silvers which have naturally smaller genes. You're so playful. And even these have only been actively bred down for the last 20 years. Although they're classed as teacup and toy cats, the reality is they still weigh up to 10 pounds. The smallest are around one third of the weight of the standard Persian, 
still much bigger than their cute canine counterparts. But more recently, there are those who have begun to get creative with their cats, and new breeds are beginning to emerge. Some more unusual than others. These weird but wonderful specimens are known as Bambino cats. They first came about after crossing Sphinx Hairless and Dwarf Munchkin cats. Selling for around $4,000, Bambino cats are still very rare in the US. They were only accepted as a breed by the International Cat Association in 2005. Get your freak on, get your freak on, get your freak Even then, only as an experimental one. And they're even rarer in the UK. One of the few people to own one is pensioner Geoffrey Miller, who recently returned to Derbyshire after 10 years of living in the States. We come across them in America about 10 years ago. But I've got to be honest with you, when I first saw it, I hated it. You know, my wife wanted it. And I bought it for her and I thought it was the most ugly thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but because she wanted it, I bought it. And as soon as it come in the house, it was beautiful. And a character, it was just different from a household moggy. They act different. They never leave me alone or my wife alone. They feel like velvet. They're absolutely beautiful. This is one of the finest species you'll ever see, is if you look at her, the length of legs in the front, the length of body. A prize specimen. They don't come no better than that. Selective breeding in pets can be controversial, but it's been part of canine history for thousands of years, so it seems inevitable that it will form part of the feline future. The smaller people like small animals as pets. And at least one person is more than happy about that. You, right? <laughs> Many super tiny animals are bred to be that way, but sometimes it just happens by accident. Like little Beyonce, when she was born in March 2012, weighing just one ounce, pictures of the world's smallest poppy were snapped up by news agencies worldwide. Never did I think of her as the smallest dog, nor did I ever think that uh, there would be a story or that she would become an international celebrity. But this isn't just the story of a super tiny record breaker. It's the story of a mini miracle who survived against all the odds and is destined to take on the world, or at least make it a better place for abandoned animals everywhere. And she really does get in some bizarre way that she's, uh, that she's got a job to do. Beyonce was born at the Grace Institute in North California a rescue centre run by a rather remarkable lady called Beth DiCaprio. OK, guys, let's go! For over ten years, Beth has devoted her life to trying to stop breeding for profit when millions of abandoned animals need homes. Spay, neuter, adopt and protect our rescued pets. It's as simple as that. What is that? Almost all the dogs that arrive at Beth's rescue centre are just hours away from being put down. These are the lucky ones. Anybody who hasn't experienced a rescue dog just has no idea, because they are forever grateful. They and, are. Yeah. They know it. They seem to know it. Beyonce's mum, Casey, was one of them. She was slated for euthanasia, and we literally had just a couple hours to pull her out of a Southern California shelter. When Beth got a scan done to make sure eight-month-old Casey would be able to deliver her baby safely, it revealed that one of the pups was going to be too small to survive. It was not going to be viable. I had prepared myself for that. And so um, she wasn't moving. But as I lifted her out, she did what probably was an agonal breath, which is kind of a reflex breath. 
but it was this startling moment of, oh my God, this puppy just moved. The foundation's horse vet, Michael, was with Beth when Casey gave birth and witnessed Beyonce's tiny breath. Beth, you know, asked me, said, is there anything you can do? And my first thought was, you know, I'm used to trying to stick needles into veins the size of a garden hose, you know, not this, you know, tiny piece of spaghetti noodle or something. We decided to try to stimulate her and get her going. So given that, you know, her size, you know, you just kind of squeeze her chest between your thumb and forefinger. And you could see in his face, he said, I got a heartbeat, and um, but she wasn't breathing. And so um, I said, you've got to do mouth to mouth. And he said, I'm not going to do it. And he handed her to me. Dog started, uh, you know, taking breaths and looked like it was responding, and and I actually didn't, I still didn't think that she would make it. But against all the odds, her little heart kept beating. Every hour was amazing that she was alive. Each and every day, the dog kept thriving. I'm like, okay, I'm wrong. That's why I don't work with small animals. <laughs> She's very much a true survivor. As she nursed her mini miracle to health, Beth began to realize just how tiny Beyonce was. She was actually so small, I realized, oh my God, she's the size of a spoon. And I put her in a spoon and took that picture because I had just never seen a dog that small. Little did she realize her photos began to circulate on the internet and suddenly baby Beyonce was getting more hits than the real Beyonce. Not sure how Beyonce felt about that. And in a sweet twist of fate, Beyonce has taken on a little orphan of her own. One week old rescue kitten, Cat Stevens. So they have been really cute together and she, uh, they snuggle and, and love each other. Beyonce was thinking, this is the coolest thing. I finally have something smaller than me. Through her SNAP campaign, Beyoncé has already helped save over a hundred little lives. We get many stories about people who have, um, have been inspired to go out and, and rescue a dog, which is just incredible. And I think every one of those, um, that's an animal that would not have a life today. So pretty, pretty incredible legacy that she's created already. As well as inspiring people to help rescue animals, Beyoncé also provided inspiration to Beth and the many volunteers who face heartbreak and hope in equal measure every single day. I at the time thought, oh no, I, I, you know, another, another one that's going to break my heart. I do believe that she was my gift and in her nine weeks she's made a huge difference to um she saved lives and if an ounce puppy can do it anybody can do it and uh we just want to carry that on